I wanted to uh, start, act, I, I, uh, I've had so many conversations with Partha which are not written up, which really deserve to be written up, but one of them, uh, there were these incipient collaborations. I'm putting this one up because if any of you are interested in pursuing it, you know, there is uh, work remaining to be done that he started that I'd, I'd love to collaborate with someone on. One of the discussions, uh, and I'm going to then, you know, give my talk, but discussions that I had with Partha for a long time was we were both unhappy with the very cavalier way in which people were declaring that animals have context-free grammars or some statement about animal vocalization syntax, which both of us didn't think were um, uh, valid based on the evidence. And we, we wanted to uh, create a framework really to analyze statements like that. And I'm just gonna read from you. We, we have a, there was this four years old uh, manuscript that got started. I'm just gonna read you the little, uh, the beginnings of this draft. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of interest in trying to describe the nature of possible syntactic systems that are inherent in bird songs. A uh, one line of research attempts to demonstrate that birds, uh, <laughs> you can see there's a draft, that these syntactic systems are essentially context-free or not. So people would like to declare, and in fact have declared, um, that you know, context-free uh, grammars have been observed in animal uh, vocalizations. Um, so we had three goals. One is, um, actually we think that this question cannot be uh, answered in the sense that people would like it to be answered. That, that is, we would like to argue that given a corpus of birdsong data, it is difficult or impossible to answer a, a very broad question like, is the grammatical system context-free or finite state? That people insist on asking this question, but in fact, they should stop asking a question, uh, which is just that question. Um, and um, so we try to formalize this uh, problem, really uh, create a statistical framework and you know, prove some impossibility uh, results. And then we said that, well, okay, if you can't ask that question, what are the legitimate questions that you can ask? Sort of develop a statistical inferential procedure. So, um, and then, you know, even more ambitious, could one do different kinds of experiments to, to pursue this? So, I, I mentioned this uh, just in the spirit of, you know, work that was started that wasn't finished. Um, but I want to tell you today about work going on. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, but I, I'm running an experimental project. And um, it relates to uh, our discussions uh, that uh, Partha and I had um, in the context of the ironic nature of neural network modeling, you know, uh, in the sense that people have made a lot of models uh, of biological neural networks, but they're ironic in the sense that they are not very data driven. Um, and uh, I, for myself, have set out to try to remove some of those ironies by trying to see if one can inject more, more data into the uh, um, uh, system. So I, I've been running this project now, which I'll tell you about, uh, and then the project is in the middle, so I, I might also tell you about some data analysis work that I've been doing with uh, uh, gene expression data from the Allen Institute. Um, so uh, there is this problem of uh, missing uh, circuits. We have relatively complete knowledge of genomes now. The genome of the rat was published in 2004. Uh, yet, um, we have very incomplete information about how the rat brain is connected. So this is a representation of, if you want, quote unquote, the connectivity matrix of the rat brain. That, that's a very imperfect representation in itself, but uh, breaking the rat brain up into about 500 regions, this is by Mihail Bota and Larry Swanson who compiled uh, this matrix. This is a, a somewhat dated version. Uh, I don't want you to look at this matrix in any detail. Uh, it, it sort of, every dot tells you whether you know, brain region A has a projection going to brain region B. Uh, what you should notice is that most of this matrix is empty. So gray is where there is no evidence, either positive or negative. And it's a little bit shocking because you see these Van Essen diagrams. You, know, you get the sense that we actually know a fair bit. Um, but the, quite the contrary is really true. So uh, I organized a, a series of uh, uh, meetings at the Banbury Center at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, uh, uh, been since I left uh, Bell Labs, uh, 
And uh, what we proposed is that we set out to, uh, that the community uh, set out to in fact rectify uh, this, this major knowledge gap that we have. So, so we can make theories of how the brain works based on data, you know, rather than uh, based on uh, speculations. Um, and uh, the, this is sort of a, I think, a boat that has to some extent uh, left the shore now. Uh, it's not just us that's interested, other people are also trying to uh, uh, do this. Um, there's a question of scale at which you can map out brain circuits. We are focusing on this uh, mesoscopic scale, which I will uh, uh, tell you about in a minute. But um, uh, one can look at the synaptic connections of individual neurons in the, in the neuropil in a small region of the brain using electron microscopy. Um, uh, what we are looking at here is uh, projection patterns. Uh, neurons send out these long-range processes. They are, in fact, the longest cells in your body uh, by far. Um, you can get a neuron that's coming from your motor cortex down to the base of your spinal cord. Um, and uh, 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 these uh, long-range projections, uh, you know, that then form uh, uh, circuit connections um, can be mapped with uh, um, uh, injections of tracer substances. Um, so you inject a tracer substance it's taken up by neurons that is actively transported along the axons, either in the anterior grade direction down to the processes, or if it is taken up by the processes, it's, uh, it can be transported retrogradely back to the uh, cell bodies. Um, uh, there are so-called classical neuroanatomical tracers, and there's also modern uh, molecular biological methods um, using viruses uh, um, to, to do this. Um, so the idea is to define a, a, a grid in the brain. We are doing this in the mouse brain because that's the most tractable and the most widely used model species. And on each grid point, uh, uh, place an injection of a tracer substance. And then after a survival period during which this tracer is actively transported along the neuron, uh, these, uh, um, the brain is sectioned up uh, and uh, possibly uh, put through immunohistochemical processing, uh, digitized um, these different sections, registered together, and then the uh, processes uh, quantified. Um, and uh, so this is like a coronal section of a mouse brain, and this is sort of a a little bit of a cartoon representation of how the injection grid uh, looks like. Um, and uh, so we set up a little uh, pipeline um, trying to uh, bring automation and uh, to some extent industrial processing uh, to bear on this thing. Um, I should say that we've been motivated by the work at the Allen Institute who have done this for uh, gene expression studies, and they are also pursuing a connectivity mapping project. So just to give you a sense of what happens in the lab, this is the sectioning part. You know, those are two mouse brains, uh, and the technician, two technicians uh, can uh, work on four mouse brains a day. You know, that's brains on a slide. Um, these go through um, uh, robotic processing. You know, uh, traditionally this kind of processing has been done by hand, but you know, that limits throughput. Uh, one can't really do it at a uh, large scale if one wants to um, have a high throughput. Um, you know, that's a couple of mouse brains, and you know, each of these boxes have a, um, well, two boxes have two brains in them. Um, and then uh, they get imaged in this uh, 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 digital slide scanner that has been developed really for digital pathology. And then you can see that there's a manual intervention still involved. The autofocus doesn't work very well. Um, and uh, okay, so you, you kind of get the idea. Now the project goals uh, is to, uh, we will be releasing the raw data uh, on a portal as it comes offline. Now I was supposed to have uh, done that already, but um, we are running a little bit behind. However, I will show you some of our uh, data, what the, uh, what the project port portal uh, looks like. Um, and this will be like a virtual microscope. So one can go uh, look through uh, a list of injections and see where, uh, you know, if the injection was at a particular uh, location, what was the probability that um, a cell body showed up in a different location in the brain or a, a projection showed up in a um, different uh, part of the brain. Um, so the idea is to do this for a reference strain and then repeat for uh, uh, mutant models um, so that we can see uh, circuit polymorphisms. So this, in some sense, will parallel 
studies of genetic uh, polymorphism. So let me see if I can just pop up the data portal here for a minute um, so you get a sense of what's going on. Um, just going to click on this first. These are uh, uh, actually um, myelin stained images. Uh, so uh, some of the fibers in the brain are myelinated. Um, and uh, what I want to this uh, what I want to show you here uh, is that Um, is that there are many scales involved, even if you were to look just at this sort of very coarse uh, representation up here in the corner, you can, you can see that, you know, I mean, uh, here's the cerebellum, here's the cortex, here's the basal ganglia. The brain is not an unstructured uh, tangle of wires by any means. You can, you can see structure even at the very coarse scale. And then when one goes down um, at more uh, finer scales, one can, uh, w w one, one can see sort of structured uh, wiring if you want. Um, now keep in mind that only a fraction of, of these wires are myelinated. Um, what we are doing in our uh, project is to, um, uh, is illustrated, uh, let's say, I'm going to pull up this brain here. Um, and let me just uh, scroll to somewhere in the middle. So here is a, a section where, uh, oh, uh, I apologize, you can't really see the contrast very well up on the screen. So you can imagine this is a normal section. There was an injection that was placed here, retrogradely labeled. Um, this is in the uh, caudate uh, so in the basal ganglia region of the brain, five minutes, okay. Um, and these are retrogradely labeled um, uh, 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 neurons. I would like to zoom in on those a little bit so you get a sense of what's going on here. Uh, okay, you can't really see this very well, uh, but y y you can see cell bodies which are um, so, let me in fact go back to the presentation because this doesn't give you a very good representation. Um, I, I had, won't have time, you know, we, we've sort of worked at linking this to the literature and so on and so forth. Uh, but anyway, so this is the section that you were looking at, which you can't really see very well. This is a little bit of a blow up, and, and you can see superposed a, a atlas section. Um, so here what we've done is taken all the sections, segmented out each of those cells, um, and they're represented here in three dimensions. The injection was here in, in the caudate. Here are retrogradely labeled neurons in the cortex and in different um, parts of the brain. This is a, a projection in the sagittal direction. This is a coronal projection. You can see that, you know, um, so each of these dots represent neurons which send, sent a process to the uh, region where uh, the injection was placed. And uh, these neurons send projections here um, across the uh, corpus callosum. The next step of quantification would be, and you know, don't pay attention to the actual names of these things. This is very preliminary, but one can then go and count where in the brain these uh, uh, um, neurons were projecting. This is a marmoset monkey brain. This is a collaborative project I have with Marcelo Rosa, who's in uh, Australia. And similarly, injection-based uh, 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 projection mapping. And um, each of these yellow dots are, are retrogradely labeled neurons, which are, uh, in this case, only the cortical data is being shown. Um, I'm kind of out of time. Uh, uh, I'll make just one point and, and then stop. Uh, you shouldn't really think of a, connect, a, a connectivity matrix for the following reason. Um, this here is, a, is an injection of um, uh, cholera toxin, which is one of the classical tracers into the basal ganglia. This he, here is neurons in layer five, which are sending processes here. 
the label that you see here is not because there was a fiber that was going like this, but rather there's a neuron here that was projecting here and also there. So this is called collateralization. So a given neuron can actually, you know, neurons are trees. Um, and trees not just locally in the dendritic carburization, they are trees in their axonal arborization patterns. Um, here is a pretty, I think, graphic example of what, what that means. This is um, uh, uh, from the literature. Um, it's a neuron, uh, two individually labeled neurons in the, uh, pre in the prefrontal cortex of the mouse and uh, from Lou Haberly, and you can see that uh, the actual brain is not that much bigger than these individual neurons. So there are these neurons which are essentially sending their tree-like arbors all over, the, all over the brain. Now, this may be special to mouse, and in humans and primates, uh, things may be a little more uh, modular, uh, so to speak. I think in the interests of time, I should stop. I will not talk about this part of my work. Feel free to ask me about it. Uh, one general message that I will send is there are lots of interesting, both supervised and unsupervised, uh, machine learning problems in this kind of big data space um, in neuroscience. Uh, previously, I was looking at time series data, including birdsong. Uh, but now we are looking at neuroanatomical data sets. And the scale of these data sets are, you know, one mouse brain is about a terabyte at light microscopy resolution. A human brain at a light microscopy resolution is a petabyte. Um, and, you know, 1,000 mouse brains, which is what you need for any of these sort of high throughput projects is about a petabyte also. So we're talking about petabytes of data. Nobody's going to, by hand, sit and uh, analyze these data sets. So automated techniques are necessary. I um, just want to thank the NIH, um, the Keck Foundation, my professorship for support. And uh, there's a lot of people involved in this work. I won't be able to thank them individually. <laughs>